Hello, everybody. Welcome to part two of chapter 2.2. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first thing that we have to still cover are the derivatives of sine and cosine. And recall, we learned this in chapter 1.3 that the limit as the change of x approaches 0 for sine of change of x all over change of x equals 1 and that the limit as change of x approaches 0 for 1 minus the cosine of x all over change of x equals 0 uh, and what's useful here is recalling these rules when you use the limit process to prove the derivatives of sine and cosine. Uh, I'm not going to do that in the notes today. I will go through that with you in class tomorrow, though. Okay. Uh, what I'd like you to understand now is that there's the rule, and again, we can derive that from a limit process, uh, that the derivative of the sine of x is equal to the cosine of x. And the derivative of cosine of x is equal to, there's my bracket, a negative sine of x. I won't prove that right now with the limit process, but let's look at some graphs. Let's prove this graphically. Uh, if we graphed the sine of x, then we would have that coordinate plane that would go kind of far out to the right. Oop, let's make sure that's bigger on the bottom too. All right. We'd have a uh, negative one and positive one. And then our graph, it's important that we have the radians of pi over two. Oh, just pi. <laughs> three halves pi or three pi over two and two pi. Now when we graph sine of x, let's use different color, uh, we know that we are crossing through the origin, that we come up to 1 over pi over 2. We cross the x-axis at pi. At 3 halves pi, we are down at negative 1. And then at 2 pi, we cross the x-axis again. Okay, put your arrows on the ends there. Beautiful. And let's graph cosine of x at the same time to really understand what's going on here. Let me zoom out a little bit so we can see everything I'm trying to do for you. Okay. And now, there we go. Okay. And then if we had the graph of cosine of x, we would have uh, the same sort of coordinate plane, right? We go far out to the right. We're still dealing with 1 and with negative 1. And we still want to find out what happens at pi over 2, at pi, at 3 pi over 2, and at 2 pi. Uh, the cosine graph is still a curve, but it starts at a different place. Uh, we're going to start it off at 1 here. And then it crosses the x-axis at that pi over 2. It reaches a uh, minimum at pi. And it crosses the x-axis at 3 pi over 2. And then it has the value of 1 again at 2 pi. And then it uh, shortly after that starts to come back down. All right, and now let's quickly analyze why the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. And if we look at the graphs, it'll make sense. And here's what I mean. Right here at pi over 2 for sine of x, our slope, our y prime here, would be 0. 
if your graph comes to a peak to the top of a curve, uh, if you zoomed in super, 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 super close at that point, you would see a perfectly horizontal line at exactly that point, at exactly pi over 2. So our slope would be 0 there. And if you take a look, if we just kind of draw a little line down to look at cosine of x at that point, oh my goodness, it looks like the values of cosine of x at pi over 2 are 0. It matches the slope value. If we look uh, at sine of x over the interval of pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, we can see that our slope, there we go, our y prime is decreasing, which means our y prime is a negative slope from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. And that makes sense because with the cosine graph, all of my values are negative from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. We can just kind of analyze that, right? From here to here, we have negative cosine of x values. And check it out. Look what happens here yet again. Our point at 3 pi over 2 for sine of x is a slope value, again, of 0. And at 3 pi over 2 for cosine of x, we can see that it is 0 again. You can draw another line down there. And we can take a one last look at one last interval from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi. We can see that our y prime is increasing, our slope is increasing, so our slope is positive. And on cosine of x from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, we can see that the y values, the cosine of x values, are also positive. And that is why the derivative of sine of x is just cosine of x. And we can see that graphically through the derivative. And cosine of x, its derivative is negative sine of x, which again makes sense if we did the same process, but we looked from cosine of x to sine of x flipped over the x-axis. So we would see uh, still crossing at the origin, but then we'd have a point not at positive 1, at negative 1 for pi over 2. Uh, and then we would have a point, it would do the curve again, and it would come up here. And that graph, the graph of negative sine of x, would be the derivative of cosine of x. I'm not going to go through that one, but we see the point. All right. Some examples of this. Um, just good things for you to know that if you have f of x equals 2 sine of x, then your f prime of x would be 2 cosine of x. If your f of x is sine of x over 2, or if it's just, you know, 1 half of sine of x, those are the same thing, then your f prime would be 1 half of cosine of x, or cosine of x over 2. If your f of x, your function, was x plus cosine of x, then your derivative would be 1 minus sine of x. Hang on a second. Let me double check something. Yeah. 1 minus sine of x. And lastly, if you have the function cosine of x minus pi over 3 sine of x, then your derivative would be negative sine of x minus pi over 3 cosine of x. Uh, I can see that the probably the most common mistake with changing these derivatives or changing the functions to their derivatives would just be forgetting to do negative sine of x. 
Uh, so just remember, whenever you're taking the derivative of cosine of x, it's negative sine of x, not just sine of x. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the derivative of natural exponential function, of the natural exponential function. Derivative of the natural exponential function. And here's the rule. I'm just going to give it to you. The derivative of e to the x, the natural exponent, is just e to the x. And we can go through the limit process at some other time if that's uh, wanted, but this is just a good rule for you guys to know from here on out, just like all the other rules of derivatives. You don't always need to prove them every single time with the limit process. We can sometimes just trust that they will work out. We can trust the mathematicians that came before us. All right. Uh, so the first example would be if we had f of x equals 3 times e to the x. Well, we know from derivatives we are free to separate that out and to put the 3 in front and then take the derivative of just e to the x. Well, it doesn't really change anything because the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x, so we're left with 3 e to the x. Okay, that didn't change much. That was easy. Next one. If we had f of x equals x squared plus e to the x, again, derivatives tell us that we can separate this out into the derivative of x squared plus the derivative of e to the x. And we know from the power rule we'd put that 2 out in front and we'd have the power now to 2 minus 1, which is just 1, so we get 2x. And derivative of e to the x again is e to the x, and we're done. Next, if we have the function sine of x minus e to the x, then we get the derivative again of each piece. So we take the derivative of the sine of x minus the derivative of e to the x. And that would leave us with cosine of x minus e to the x. All right, the last topic we're going to talk about in this video are rates of change. And first we're going to recap about average velocity. because I don't really expect you to have remembered this. Uh, average velocity is essentially just the change in s over the change in t, which in words means the change in position, all over the change in time. And you can see this is starting to look very similar to our rate of change formula, our average rate of change formula, where we have a change of x over a change of y. And that leads me to my next point uh, for when we're taking the average, or pardon me, not average anymore, just the velocity or the instantaneous velocity, those are interchangeable terms. we are taking that change at exactly one point. And remember, uh, we already have a formula that does that for us. We already know the formula, the limit definition of a derivative, right? We know that a derivative finds a change at exactly one point. So what we can do then is apply that limit function, the limit of that function, to our change of s over a change of t, and here's what I mean. Uh, we'll be taking this time the limit as change of t approaches 0, not x, and we're going to take s of t plus change in t, s instead of f of x, and then we say minus s of t all over our change in t. So you can see the similarities there. Uh, and the good news is we're pros at this already. We already know how to take the limit definition of a derivative 
And what we're going to do now is apply this to a word problem. So suppose that at time zero, a diver jumps from a platform diving board that is 32 feet above the water. All right, and then we would say because the initial velocity of the diver is 16 feet per second. The position of the diver is right, so the position of the diver is uh, S of T that stands for position uh, is negative 16 T squared plus 16 T plus 32 and what we want to know is two things First part A, when does the diver hit the water? And part B, what is the diver's velocity at impact? So to begin with part A, when does the diver hit the water? Well that actually we don't need calculus for. That we only need algebra 2 for. What the position will be when the pardon me, what the position will be when the diver hits the water is 0. So what we know so far from that is that we have our original position equation, but we know this part already. We know the output is going to be zero. The position part is going to be zero. And so we solve for t now. And again, we know already from algebra 2 that we can factor this, and we can get some zeros right of the function. Uh, that's how we'll start solving for t. So we will have 0 equals. We can factor out a 16. So let's do that. Let's take out a negative 16, actually. And we get t squared minus 16t. Oh, pardon me. Minus just t. And then minus 2. When we keep on factoring, we get the factors of t plus 1. and t minus 2. When we set these factors equal to 0, we would get t equals negative 1 or t equals positive 2. So, t stands for time. Time cannot be negative time cannot be a negative number. So we know instantly that only one of these solutions works. And that is 2. This is in terms of seconds. So let's label this thing part A. All right. Uh, what we can say then as our answer is the diver hits the water after 2 seconds. Ooh, that's pretty quick. To answer part B, 
What is the diver's velocity? Well, that means we want to know their exact velocity at that exact point of two seconds. So what we're going to do then is first find the derivative. Uh, we have our limit definition of the derivative, limit definition of instantaneous velocity. So we'll write that out again. And now we're going to use the limit process. Our first uh, half of the numerator, we're going to use our original S of T function. So we're going to say negative 16 times T plus change in T squared plus 16 times t plus change in t plus 32 and then we're going to say minus our original negative 16 t squared plus 16 t plus 32 and we put that all over the change in t. I'm going to expand this binomial first. Negative 16 times t squared plus 2t change in t plus change in t squared. And then we have plus 16t plus 16 change in t plus 32 plus 16t squared minus 16t minus 32 all over the change in t and we just keep going. Uh, we have negative 16t squared minus 32t change in t minus 16 change in t squared plus 16t plus 16 change of t plus 32 plus 16t squared minus 16t minus 32. All over change in t. Wow. All right. So now what we're going to do is canceling what we can. Uh, we've got a negative six. Oh, there we go. You got a positive 32 and a negative 32. Let's see. I believe that's all we can cancel out. So the next step is factoring and canceling. Uh, if I factor out a change of t from the top, I get negative 32t minus 16 change of t plus 16 all over our change of t, at which point we cross these out we get negative 32 t minus 16 change of t plus 16. And again, we, we're taking the limit originally, so when we take the limit of this, change of t approaches 0, we substitute in 0 next to this 16, and we are left with s prime of t equal to negative 32 t plus 16. Now, again, we were interested in the point of impact, how fast they were going when they hit the water. Well, we already know something. We know that t was equal to 2 when they hit the water, so we can substitute in 2 here. s prime of 2 equals negative 32 times 2 plus 6, which is going to be... Oh, this is a 16. That was my mistake. Uh, negative 48. And remember, this is a velocity of speed. So our units here are going to be in feet per second. And that comes from when we were originally talking about 
the initial velocity being 16 feet per second. Okay, that's all I have to show you. Thanks for watching.